singing from? Jesse asked me for something, or uh, Ken asked me to say something. Give him a cool detail. That was pretty cool. <laughs> That's cool. All right. So um, this is this is going to be kind of short. So somewhere between like a mix of like an AMS, a type mm -hmm. talk, and, and a seminar. Um, and and I and that's somewhat deliberate, and also because uh, this 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 talk will mostly entail work that we're going to do for E3, which, as everyone knows, is still being uh, worked on in terms of structure, parameterization, structure, and so forth. So, um, but but the overall the overall topic is is plan what we plan to do for determining the optimal combination of free parameters, which there are many, to tune the GIS E3 GCM. And admittedly, I'm I'm only focusing today on the clouds free parameters. So I know there are other free parameters and things like the dynamical core and, and so forth and ocean parameters and uh, land parameters, but my comfort is with clouds. So that's that'll be that'll be today's focus. The implications extrapolating to other other aspects of the model should be uh, should be clear hopefully. So um, everyone you know is pretty pretty much involved in cloud modeling, but uh, this was an intro slide I often give, uh, show people when I talk about this work um, that, that shows the number of parameters that we have to think about setting in a global climate model, you know, cloud parameterization. And these parameters are often not known from observations. They are, they are representing processes such as, you know, um, how much ice is to train at the edges of collective cores and how big the particles are and, and how quickly ice particles go from small size to big size and precipitate out. Um, turbulence things, you know, entrainment, detrainment, how inhomogeneous the scene is and so forth. We have parameters, you know, for all these, all these different things in, in a GCM uh, cloud parameterization. And you know these these are typically set globally, right? But then they so these global settings then impact each individual you know, grid box, right? Uh, and they're often you know sort of put in as like, scaling parameters, but uh, but again they don't change. They typically don't change by grid box or you know lat lon or or season in, in general. And so if we think about specific to GIS GIS GCM. So prior to E3, right, and this is something that we typically would give Larissa or someone else, um, when we were changing parameters in the, in, in the priority GIS E3 GCM, we would talk about things like U not not A and U not not B, and those would be relative humidity thresholds for cloud formation, multipliers that, that govern um, autoconversion from cloud to precip size particles or drops, uh, and then multipliers, for instance, that uh, might that might dictate the ultimate size of affected radii, which would then impact your top of the atmosphere radiation and radiation profile and so forth. Um, I would say since I got here three years ago, these are the ones we've been talking about, a list of five, okay? Now, fast forward to now, this is with the new E3, and this is a document I sent around about a, a, year, and a, a year plus ago, and I, everything's small here, you're not supposed to be able to read these, but the point is, there's a lot more. <laughs> the numbers increased drastically, and we spent probably a good number of months actually trying to keep this list under 20, okay? These are 20 unexplored parameters, for instance, that uh, affect the GCM climatology, and the settings, we don't know what they should be. So there's no simple list we can just give to Larissa or whomever's tuning of the GCM uh, to say, hey, play around with these. It's fully unexplored. Uh, and we have to figure out some way to, um, we can either do what a lot of GCM groups do, which is pick your favorite pet parameters and perturb them. And let's fix the other, you know, 85% of the parameters to something, and let's just focus on a few, which keeps the, pr the, tr the problem tractable. But there are more sophisticated ways of sampling this multi-dimensional state space if you, if you bring in some of the, uh, uh, you know, routines and some of the work that people do on sampling multi-dimensional state spaces. And, uh, and there's, there's, much, there's much out there uh, regarding, regarding sampling. Now, as I said, the recent, what most people do is they pick a few parameters, right? So here's, here's a recent example from Martin et al, 2012. 
and uh, which was one of the one of the I would say first papers that brought uh, to light some of the things the GCM community does for tuning GCMs and how we might want to do the do tuning. And uh, so what, what Martin and you know you probably can't see all the labels, but basically he picks five parameters, perturbs them, and then sees their impact on the y-axis, uh, which are various uh, climatologies like radiation, cloud cover, cloud liquid water, water vapor. And if you're in the green, that's the good zone. So if you perturb a param parameter, you know, and you're in the green, that means you're matching the climatologies. And that's what he wants to perturb, what he wants to do is perturb everything one by one to get agreement with climatologies. Okay, so um, one important takeaway from this is uh, it's done on a parameter, one parameter at a time basis. So it's not like some multi-dimensional state space exploration where you perturb, where you have some sort of automated sampler that searches around and picks the combinations. He does it, he fixes all the other four and then per perturbs one, okay? Um, and so this, this kind of, th this paper and then some others, including Gavin's paper that just came out in 2017, um, sort of uh, summarize the discussion on, okay, this is fine, maybe we disagree on how we do this, but the point is we need to be transparent on how parameter combinations are decided upon. Um, and the overarching question, of course, is does it matter? <laughs> so if it doesn't matter, if it just changes things by you know pennies, then uh, who cares, right? But uh, it, it's possible that how we, how we search for combinations of parameters may matter. What we decide on may matter for the climate simulations of tomorrow. Um, and then there are multiple, multiple tuning strategies. Great. Yeah. So here you see the same parameter, for instance, will have a, a different impact uh, in the, for different climatology. For example, some will be, you know, greater skill, some other. That's right. And, and, and it's a, it's a nonlinear problem. So, so one of my, one of my, I wouldn't say complaints or maybe some, some critique about this paper is what would appear to be lack of sensitivity in one field can actually change if they actually changed, if they looked at a different part of this multidimensional state space. So if they, like for here, here for instance, if they actually set all these other four parameters to something completely different and then redid the sensitivity here, it may actually show to be more sensitive because that it's like a multidimensional, you know, hypercube sort of thing, right? So I think you can somehow, you can sometimes get these, these interpretations that, oh, there's no sensitivity to this. Well, it is if you set the other four parameters to something different. Or so that's such a difference between like just a first order correction like this, you know, where everything just depends, and where everything is independent, and then where you have second order, where you can start getting covariance. That's right. So I so that's, yeah, that's right. That's right. But also in the end, if you if you based your choices only on schemes like that, you would have to pick your favorite climatology that yeah, you do. to have a better skill, right? You do. Um, or or you can also try to employ instead of instead of fixing all your parameters and changing one at a time, you can try to employ some um, smart sampler that just searches through this multidimensional space as it is to try to uh, get best agreement with all the climatologies at once, simultaneously. But you can't do that, you know, I mean, if you do that you know, with your eyes or manually if you have a couple parameters, five becomes a bit prohibitive. <laughs> five times four times three is a lot of combinations. And, and you never know quite what resolution you should be perturbing parameters at. So it's, it's difficult. Um, so this, this was sort of uh, one, of the, one of the papers that talked about here's, how we, here's, here's a way to perturb, here's how we do it, here's the effect on some, some, some climatology fields. In Gavin's 2017 paper, um, this, was, this was even more, uh, and you can read through it if you haven't. Um, here, here he had a table of all the individual modeling centers talking about how they tune. What is, their, what is their broad approach? Do they tune to climate sensitivity? Do they use a historical temperature trend? Do they tune to a radiative imbalance pre-industrial period? Or do they tune to a, a radiative imbalance you know, uh, for the present day and, and so forth? And this was all about trying to, trying to be uh, transparent on how parameter combinations are, are decided upon. The last one was, uh, Sort of accidentally, when I came here to GIS, right at the beginning of 2015, I, I was I had actually come from a, a satellite retrieval field. I knew nothing about GCMs, except every paper I ever wrote always started out with these observations have the potential to impact 
GCMs and you know development in the future, you know that sort of thing. Well, I didn't know anything else, and so what, what I had done was um, spent you know most of my graduate and postdoc career trying to develop better observations of rainfall and cloud water parameters, and I had just finished this paper um, looking at observed rain you know observed rainfall uh, one week after I arrived at GIS, and I was uh, looking at a, a very uh, often used satellite rainfall retrieval algorithm that contributes also to a satellite retrieval product, SSMI, that goes into GPCP, and we obviously all know GPCP rainfall, GPCP rainfall product. And so what I, had, what I had found was, if we change our assumption about how, what the errors are on the satellite input radiances that go into producing these rainfall products, we can change the answer by quite a bit. I remember my, my advisor was not happy with this. Um, so, and, and, and the thing is we don't know what the error should be in input, when you have the input satellite observation coming in, which is usually some sort of radiation measurement. Uh, and then we simulate that using a forward model so we can then back out and get a retrieval. We don't know what error, what truly what the errors are on the observations and we don't, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a bit of a problem, right? So if I, what I did was I just was like, okay, let's let's just scale. Let's look at like, at this algorithm. They have they have assumed errors, and let's just scale them by a factor of two, or you know, cut the errors in half, and let's look at the rainfall PDFs, the PDF, and see how they change on the monthly monthly time scale. And so it turns out, and if the scale factor of two seems large, do note that the initial the, the original magnitudes of errors themselves assumed were on the order of one to two kelvins. And any particular thing, whether it be sun shining onto um, the satellite instrument or uh, some sort of orbital, uh, some sort of uh, uh, inner calibration issue, anything can change the assumed errors by a couple kelvins. So the errors are small that we assume and they can easily change. We don't want they should be. But the point is, if you change them with a couple kelvins, what you assume, you can change the rainfall PDFs by Somewhere you know up to fifty percent. Okay, so you can shift things up and down, and it alias us to the global mean, where we could actually increase errors by a factor of two, and we actually retrieve five percent less in terms of global mean rainfall. <laughs> this is like really disconcerting, right? And actually, you could pick a GCM, and you could probably find out which <laughs> which error in the observations corresponds best to your GCM, which is also kind of disconcerting. But it made me think about what's tr what's truth, right? So, um, so when I came here and I was I was thinking about I was doing some convective parameterization work, and uh, and, and at the time they say, well, now you need to figure out how to tune the model and use these observational data sets. I had on my head in my mind like which observational data set for if I have one parameter, which one do I use, right? Because they're all potentially they're all different, right? And here's here's another. Uh, Example of other, it's not unique to rainfall. So recently, uh, uh, Lev Sok and Hoi Su came up with this paper that showed cloud water over the oceans varied on by with bias. We're not talking about uncertainty, a bias between two different what we consider to be well-regarded estimates. Bias is on the order of fifty percent, which is huge. And if we look in water here, this is from the OPS. Both of these are from the OPS for MIPS archive, which everyone probably knows about. If I look at water vapor, it's a function of latitude and height. So these are water vapor profiles. And I look at in, in airs climatology. This is the latest algorithm, airs version six, and uh, combined with uh, MLS, the microwave limb sounder instrument above, uh, higher up in the atmosphere. And I construct a, a, a water vapor climatology as a function of latitude and height. I get this. If I use Merit 2, I get this. And if I look at the difference, I have this. So Merit 2 says, Above the melting level, <laughs> that differences between in in, uh, in terms of percent differences for water vapor are on the order of 50 to 100 percent. So if you're using Mera 2 as your benchmark for truth versus Airs V6, you might be misled into thinking about how to tune the GCM to get a better climatology. Same thing, you know, you can look at you can pick your pick your uh, your NASA satellite observational product. Here's one that I, I was involved in making uh, this total liquid water path product. 
takes into account the amount of cloud water and rain water in the atmosphere of the oceans. And this other well-used one, trim, three, trim, the trim uh, cloud water product. And I made a map. And if you look at the differences, it's over the same time periods. If you look at the differences, you see these huge biases. And they're not even constant. So if you look, for instance, in where we typically think of uh, the stratocumulus uh, clouds occurring, you see one product has more stratocumulus cloud than the other in terms of the amount of liquid or the juiciness of the clouds, whereas the other in the deep in the deep convective regimes have more has more cloud water than the other. So they reverse. The biases are not some, some fixed bias that is constant across the tropics. It depends on the region. Which are the exact same problems we try to try to account for in the GCM, right? Regional discrepancies, but in using what we think is truth. But the argument I try to make is I don't know if we know truth, right? At least as it, as it goes towards cloud and water vapor sort of parameters. So this is just taking the water vapor product, which for which it was a good example, and comparing to a recent, a recent E3 simulation. And so if I look at errors relative to uh, E3, okay, so GCM minus errors, we're biased high here. If I do it compared to Mera 2, we're biased low. So the bias is reverse. <laughs> and, uh, and so these sort of things, you know, uh, we had a, an E2.2 meeting not so long ago when we, when we discussed some of this. Um, we have seen some biases in Mera 2, relative, in the GCM relative to Mera 2, when I was saying, you know, some of these biases are attributed to the fact that Mera 2 is biased, right? And so, this, this, is, this is what we keep running into, right, when trying to, that we need to think about when we're trying to tune a GCM. And it's a decision I wouldn't want to make. I don't want to be, I don't want to say, pick the right observational product to tune a GCM. Because I feel like that's fruitless. I'd like to kind of take into account all the well-regarded products and perhaps in some way just simply account for the bias between the two and bring that bias into the tuning procedure. So I'm not choosing one product or another. I'm just I'm using both, and I'm just I'm just penalizing the model less in certain regions or regimes if the two observational products have a have a large bias between between them. Okay, so that that is that is kind of where the reason I'm showing all the observational differences and and, and what I'm thinking about for uh, for tuning a GCM so that I can avoid having to to, to define what truth is. And the question is, does it matter? Right? Does it matter if, if, if we tune in that way, if we uh, have some, some way to penalize a model in a different way for disagreement with an observational product, if we take into account bias, does that change our ensemble of parameter combinations that we say are admittable or admissible? Well, it turns out we did a little bit of this with E2.1. And uh, I had added, this, is, this was with um, a couple of the E3 cloud features. So it started with, e, with, with what at the time was, with, what, I think it's pretty much E2.1 now. They added the cold pole parameterization and co new, new convective ice parameterization, things that made clouds look a little better. And, um, and what I wanted to do was uh, test some of my ideas on how to, how, to, how to tune a GCM and how to bring in observational bias. So what we have here is there were five parameters. Those are the ones I showed in earlier in the slides. And I come up with this model penalty function. Right? It's very simple. You just sum up over i, j, and t. So i and j are Latin law, law and lat, and t is time, of course. And you can, you have your model field, you know, whatever it is, okay, water vapor, rainfall, whatever you want. And then you have your retrieval field, right? And you can design a little sampler to then pen, you know, come up with a penalty function. You sum it over however many parameters you want to sum over, you know whether it's you know water vapor, or cloud, cloud fraction, whatever. Um, we were I forget which ones we were picking, but we had a few in there. Um, and then W, in most cases, if you use some sort of automatic uh, penalty function or some sort of automated pen way of penalizing a model for discrepancies with ops, usually W is set to one, right? Because there's no there's a uh, well because no one takes into account observational bias. Right? And, and you could take into account product uncertainty 
the, the observational product uncertainty, which is usually in their net CDF or HDF files, is usually really small. Right? They'll say, oh, there's a 10% error on the climatology. You kind of think of that due to random error in, in brightness, temperatures, radiances. That's not, that doesn't really take into account the things that we can't correct for, like the fundamental differences in retrieval algorithms from one product to another. Okay, it's mostly, that mostly pertains to just errors in the input radiances or brightness temperatures, for instance. So what we did here, though, is, okay, let's, let's set W equal to the difference between we're using two observational products for each parameter we're looking at, rainfall, cloud, and so forth. Let's set W equal to the bias between the two observational products. So we incorporate, so we sum this up over all the observational products, and W for the equivalent parameter is just equal as a function of Latin long to the difference between the observational products. So when W is 1, and if we look at how our goodness or our comparison with um, of the model with the observations, how it compares, when W is equal to 1, we find that there's only one plausible combination of the relative humidity threshold for cloud, uh, for cloud formation and the liquid water content threshold that governs how quickly cloud water goes to precipitation. There's only one place where it's, there's a good fit, and it's up here, where you have to have a high relative humidity threshold for cloud and a high liquid water content threshold for precipitation. This is what we say, this is the admissible, this is the, the plausible range of how we can vary these two parameters to get a good fit between the GCM climatologies and the observational climatology. Now, when we make W equal to the bias between two observational products, and we redo this, we actually end up with two separate peaks in goodness. We find the same mode that we had before, then we have this other one that corresponds to a smaller threshold for cloud formation, but then the clouds don't dissipate that quickly because they're not raining out, right? So you end up actually with the same similar climatologies in terms of the map. It's just the processes are different that give you that, right? One has a fast, it takes a while for cloud to form, and, and, uh, uh, and then it, it also, the, the threshold is also higher for precipitation, so it doesn't, it doesn't rain out right away. And this one down here where it um, rains out more quickly, but you have a lower threshold for, for cloud formation. So this, you can, you know, I'm showing two dimensions, but you can extend this to n dimensions, right? And it actually mattered uh, in our results. We're like, well, this is another combination. So what is that, does that combination matter of parameters? You know, what, is it, what does it do, right? And, uh, and the other thing was, you know, we wanted to figure out a way, if we want to automate this, we want to figure out a way to search this multi-dimensional state space. And my, my collaborator on this project, Marcus uh, Van Leerwalk, he is the one who's actually figuring out some way to smartly sample um, all the parameters in the multi-dimensional state space to kind of find the, these little peaks of what we consider to be good combinations of parameters. Yeah, on that point, I mean, how likely are you to encounter that, that maximum fit? Because it's very sensitive right to where you start. So, oh, you mean like, like, I mean in terms of the sampler? Yeah, algorithm? in terms of where you start. I know sometimes you can encounter a maximum, and sometimes you can drift away. Uh, like local maxima? Yeah. Yeah, we're trying to find a local maxima, so we don't want to remove them. Okay. We, want it, we want to say, so our ultimate goal is to find, whereas without observational bias accounted for, we didn't have many local maxima. When we take into account, we do. And we want to keep track of all of them to see if we ran a long-term simulation with all the little mo local maxima and goodness of, of the fit between the model field and the, and the observations, does it, does it mean something different for climatologies, for, for a model climatology? So, so we're still not, we're not choosing. We're still, we're still trying to avoid having to make a, cho uh, you know, a choice on the best local maxima. We want to save them all. When I look at, whoops, what happened there? It's spinning, it's spinning, it's spinning. Know. Death. <laughs> Microsoft encounter problem and use codes. Don't send. Zoom. 
just click the number. I forget the number. Is. No. Oh, well, here we are. So, um, so when we look at the his the histogram of all the parameter conditions for those five I was talking about for E two E two point one, they look like this, right? So this was the u not u not not a u not not b w mu mu x multipliers and so forth. This very these very broad histograms of plausible of plausible parameter settings that give you good climatologies that compare to the observational products in the case where you take into account observational product discrepancy. And here was the like really interesting thing that emerged. So. When you don't have, when you don't take into account observational bias, okay, the best we could ever do in terms of radiation when we compare the GCM to the series EBEF, you know, top of the atmosphere short wave product, for instance, this is the best we could ever find among all of our plausible combinations. This is how as good as we could go. This and and this is a few physics steps short of our latest greatest E three, where we now don't even have this problem. Of you know problem of, of short of short wave bias in the stratocumulus regimes. This is order using an older version of the GCM, as I said. When I take into account observational bias, we end up with climatologies that drastically change the southern oceans short wave biases, but drastically make worse the you know ITCZ the Westpac biases, right? And this never would have never emerged. It was never a consideration, but you know because we were never um, because we never really had this multi-dimensional accounting for all the observational biases. The other interesting thing was we found that in ta sort of Taylor diagrams, which hopefully everyone knows what these are, so um, this takes into account pattern correlations between your, you know, in this case precipitation, your model precipitation and observed precipitation, both in terms of the correlation between the fields and, center and amplitude of the standard deviation for the fields and then the differences. And, and you want to be close to the observations if you're in perfect agreement with the observations, which are right here. They lie in this portion of the state space. And we found that um, what happens when we take into account observational bias is we, we have all these possible combinations that give us the same Taylor score, for instance, for a number of parameters, for precipitation or absorbed short wave here. But then if I color coded them according to you know, regional bias, say in the Southern Oceans, surely bias. They were all they were all different. Where you could have biases ranging from plus twenty watts per meter squared to plus five. So we have sort of you know come up with this. This could this could certainly found that you know there's a, there was a lot of a lot of new model configurations that came out and that looked good in Taylor diagrams, but then were had huge regional regional radiation biases that just were not depicted well in a Taylor diagram. Um, the other really interesting thing was when we didn't account for observational bias, the ITCC, this is latitude and this is rainfall and amplitude. So you're looking at the, uh, like an ITCC, like you know, just a latitude climatology, zonal climatology. And when we take into account observational bias, Suddenly, we can like minimize, can change the structure and the shape of the ITCZ in a whole new slew of configurations. And so, this was kind of, kind of interesting. I mean, it was also kind of, kind of, um, kind of made us wonder, you know, does this, does this matter? You know, these these sort of differences that you can you can get if you take into account, if you figure out somebody to take into account observational bias. It's possible, um, and so so this is this is just a, s a summary, and then I have one and then one more slide after this, um, and and hope, hoping we can just have some discussion because because this hasn't been done for E three, so we're trying to figure out a way. What should our approach be for E three, um, and along these lines, which I hope we'll, we'll take into account observational bias. So bias is sometimes large. As I mentioned, often greater of greater magnitude than the posted product uncertainty, which you can get out of you know any product net CDF file. Um, and uh, every model has has some unknown number of parameters that need optimization. And so, 
what we have found using a version of E2.1 is that our ranges, our, our model's range of parameters is expanded. Plausible combinations, the, the multi-dimensional space is expanded of, of, plausible, you know, of, what, of what we can do, what we can use as, as combinations. It's expanded if we take into account by these biases. Um, we're planning to use this approach for E3 um, with the smart sampler being developed by Marcus. And so this goes to Claire's, Claire's question. We're not, we're not, this isn't, this isn't to get us to one combination of parameters. And I think that's, that's kind of dangerous as well because, um, because there are many multiple combinations that still give us good climatologies. That's the point of this. It opens the door for many combinations of parameters that allows that, that we can agree with the products within an observational bias a lot allotment. Okay, so that's important to say. The one thing we want, to, what we're trying to figure out right now is how long do we need to do runs to get us into the neighborhoods of parameter of these different combinations of parameters? Would we be in the neighborhood? So this isn't going to be specifically used for radiated balancing. This is just to get us into if you think in vector space, of the neighborhoods of plausible combinations of parameters. At which point we would, for instance, give Larissa or whomever is, is doing the final balancing in the model, you would give her a number of different uh, neighborhoods of parameter combinations, and she would then pick whichever one she wants to use or one that we decide on as a group. She would then pick one vector and perturb those to get back into radiate balance. Because it's always a constraint that even if we have these multiple combinations of parameters, we're always close, we're not that far out of radiated balance because you can't None of, one combination is not admissible if you're out of radiated balance by too much. If you're 10 watts per meter squared out of balance, you can't use it, even if it gives you a good, a good climatology. So, so we're using this to get us into the neighborhood, and then the final, for the final little you know, uh, uh, tuning and balancing would, would be done manually on one parameter vector. <coughs> now, this was something that we had recently done, um, Bastian and I. Uh, it turns out that you know, there are other ways to tune, right? So, um, a lot of what I showed before was all map related, you know, map in terms of what I mean by, you know, Latin lawn. But what if we, what if we, what if we said um, there, are multiple, there are multiple parameter combinations that give you good map comparisons against some observational product, but when you look at a cluster or at a cloud regime scale, your clusters can change. So in other words, you can get it, you're getting a good climatology in the map sense, but for the wrong reasons potentially. So what if we, what if we decide to tune parameters to cloud clusters, for instance, and not just global map climatologies? So this was an example um, of, of an experiment we did where I I, I perturbed three, you know, I perturbed a couple global parameters, and then and Bastian had a clustering algorithm. I think that can maybe 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 <laughs> yes. use right. <laughs> And uh, and so on the on the x-axis is just the total water content integrated, you know. So integrated with integrated water content. Uh, or I'm sorry, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's grams. It, it's it's grams per kilogram. So it's profiles pay as a function of height for different cloud clusters. Cluster one, two, and three. And this would be, for instance, a really deep convective cloud cluster. And this would be like a shallow shallow cloud cluster. And what I did was I, I just uh, let's let's run this little this using Marcus's early results for sampling. Let's just like run a sample real fast over a, over a short list of parameters and try to perturb them and see what happens, see if I can change the clusters. And it turns out that I can change the global parameters, so these are global parameters, that impacts cluster representation. So here's after I change parameters. Now both of these were admissible. Like both, the climatologies, you know, and you can imagine because you, what, what happened was the frequency of occurrence changed. So you can end up with similar global climatologies, but different cluster scale results. And so this was an example of how you can actually, you can change global parameters that impact cluster, cluster representations of clouds from the cluster perspective. Uh, and that's another way that we could also potentially think about tuning GCM with the expectation then that the right emergent climatology would happen, or as a constraint, it has to come out still. So. Um, uh, that's all I have. So, no real results, but just hopefully some some thoughts that people might have. That's it.
good at questions. Mm -hmm.